Hello and welcome to another edition of Kansas City Experience. I'm John McGrath. KCX is a monthly program that pulls together a selection of segments from KCPT, Flatland, and 909 The Bridge that you might have missed. Coming up this month on KCX from the KCPT documentary Finding Refuge in KC, celebrity chef Lydia Bastianich shares her experiences as a refugee. They made a plan. My mother, my brother, and I would go to visit supposedly a sick aunt in Trieste. And uh, my father couldn't come because they wouldn't allow him, they wouldn't give him uh, a visa. My father showed up at the door. He had escaped. He literally escaped the border. They shot at him, the, the dogs. He collapsed right in front of, you know, us kids got up, ran out to see. And we were all together now in Trieste. We take a look at how local climate change activists are pushing for change. And also check out how a local coffee house is doing its part to protect the environment. Like we know it's not a perfect solution, but our goal isn't to like just create another product that you're gonna throw away. Lucky Garcia is a war vet who uses poetry as a form of therapy. We share one of her pieces about her experiences with PTSD. PTSD. Tragic toxic treason, Taliban torture targets. The television tells a tall tale of trading murder for freedom. Telling the truth takes time and threatens to take your life. We try to separate the fact from the fiction when it comes to Tom Pendergast and the mafia. First of all, there was no Pendergast mafia. There was an Italian mafia in Kansas City, which was very notorious and with whom Pendergast had a very close relationship. And secondly, boss Tom Pendergast was not a gangster. He did not order hits on anybody. There are no bodies buried in Brush Creek. And from our 909 The Bridge session, British artist Yola performs Walk Through Fire. First, we tackle a curious KC question about the artists and the gentrification of the crossroads. Well, I'm, I'm Dana Gibson, and uh, I, I work as a community developer here in the downtown Kansas City area. I've worked here for 35 years in, in developing uh, community and developing housing, uh, primarily for, for creative, creative people to live and work in. The quandary that that artists are facing is the lack of ownership and lack of control over their future. Um, and so they're, they're, the result is with, without a, a patron, uh, with, you know, without someone uh, with largesse to provide the opportunity for them, they have to find other alternatives. And hopefully these artists will, will discover new neighborhoods where they can create that synergy and that, that group effort that will again allow the, the art buying public to find them. The Crossroads has been improving and upgrading and buildings are being renovated for years now. So artists have been moving for years. So many of them have, have moved to the area along Troost. They're moving north of the river. They're moving to Strawberry Hill in Kansas City, Kansas, along Southwest Boulevard to the west, kind of fanning out through, throughout the metro area. Um, and one of the interesting places where artists are moving to now is just east of the KCPT studios in the Tower East neighborhood. And uh, it's really interesting to watch the, the young artists that are, are immersing themselves into the neighborhood here. And uh, one of the recent moves has been by the Kansas City Artists Coalition, which was in the River Market neighborhood for 35 years and they've just relocated to Tower East. They have gallery space there. They also, um, as part of their move, they have developed studio space for artists to work in, low cost studio space. Um, they're trying to provide part of the solution for the artists that are being displaced from other parts of the city. There is a real need for, for uh, civic support both governmental and individual and foundations to, to continue growing. What's really been, been a, a tremendous boon to, to the experience of living in Kansas City. I was born in 1947 
and I was born in Istria, which was part of Italy. Uh, but after World War II, it was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. We could no longer speak Italian. We couldn't go to church. And they changed our name from Maticchio to Motica. We lived in the city of Pula. Uh, but my grandmother lived just outside in a little town. Uh, with grandma, we could speak Italian. Sometimes she did sneak us to church and, and so on. So we were freer. We had chickens, we had ducks, we had uh, goats, we had two pigs every year which we would slaughter, make the prosciutto, make the bacon, make the uh, sausages. I was involved in running to pick up the peas when they were ripe, helping grandma to harvest the potatoes. And you take it in your hand and it's still warm and I can still feel it now, almost as it had life. Uh, the perfect fig, the taste of the perfect fig, the bushes of rosemary that grandma would l send me to sort of harvest. We even played hide and seek, uh, seek as kids in the rosemary bushes. As we were growing up, of course, things became uh, uh, ever more, uh, um, I would say, difficult. We would get knocks on the door to see where my father was, was he up to, taken for interrogation and then finally let loose after a week or two in jail. In that area, the terrain is very rocky and there are deep foibe, they're called. They're, they're like caves, but they just are perpendicular caves and they would come at night, take uh, the sons and the husbands and they were tied together usually with, with uh, barbed wire and thrown in this foibe. And some of them were alive for days in there. And so uh, they, they made a plan. And the plan was that my mother, my brother and I would go to visit supposedly a sick aunt in Trieste. And uh, my father couldn't come because they wouldn't allow him, they wouldn't give him uh, a visa. My aunt was perfectly fine. Uh, but about 10 days later, my father showed up at the door. He had escaped. He literally escaped the border. They shot at him. The, the dogs, uh, scent dogs were running after him. And he, I, he collapsed right in front of, you know, us kids got up, ran out to see. And we were all together now in Trieste. The visas that we had were limited. And my father had no papers. And the only protection that we could get is go to the police and declare that we are refugees and that we are seeking asylum. Uh, the camp uh, was called San Saba, Riseria. That's all we heard, that it was a, a rice uh, factory. We didn't know the history of it. Before us, it was a Nazi concentration camp. The quarantine where I went with my mother was rather dark. It had a, a window just like you do in prison with bars, looking on this courtyard. And I remember looking out of those bars, holding on, hoping to see my father and my brother because I thought I was never going to see them. And we stayed in the camp for two years, awaiting an opportunity for a country to accept us. When we got the acceptance to come to the United States, that was in 1958, and Dwight Eisenhower was the president, the Catholic Relief Services got us ready, and then they handed us over to the Catholic Charities here. And uh, in about uh, two, three weeks thereafter, they found a job for my father in New Jersey. He was a mechanic. They found uh, a little home for us, and uh, they settled us in. The care that uh, one had at that time for immigrants was very moving. And we certainly felt the responsibility of giving back and becoming part of America as soon as we could. When I think back, I think how important that period of my life was in forming me who I am today as a person. My brother and I didn't know we were not going to go back. I hadn't said goodbye to grandma, to my friends, to my goats. I had my baby goats. And all of that, I think, left a desire in me for connection. And food was my connector. Uh, so cooking the aromas that I remember for grandma, even rosemary brought me back to grandma. And cooking became my way of communicating thereafter. My life has been a very rewarding life. Sometimes I get asked, Lydia, boy, you had a tough beginning. Maybe, in a way, but I think that really set me who I am. I have a beautiful family, two children, five grandchildren, restaurants I have 
quite a few on and off. 13 cookbooks, my memoir now. My uh, public television series has been running for 20 years, but I never forgot that I am who I am because somebody cared, somebody helped. Our goal here in Kansas City was to turn out hundreds of young people and people in the community. And we held two separate rallies, one in the morning on UMKC campus. Later that evening, we had 500 people show up there. And that was our coalition of different groups who are active on different issues in the Kansas City area. Um, I'm here with Wildlight. We're a nonprofit organization that works to promote civic engagement. So we're here today to register voters and just to encourage them to be more engaged in what's going on and let their voice be heard, especially in the upcoming local elections where their vote and their voice has a lot of power. I'm Kristen Riott and I'm executive director of Bridging the Gap. We have managed the city of Kansas City, Missouri's recycling for 27 years now. Fossil for UMKC is an organization at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. We're trying to get um, the University of Missouri to divest their endowment pool from the fossil fuel industry. Citizens Climate Lobby is an organization that is international. Uh, we have a bill H.R. 763, uh, dealing with a carbon fee and a public dividend. The point of that is to make carbon emissions more expensive. I am with Kansas City Vegans for Climate Justice. Our mission is to educate people on the impacts of animal agriculture on climate change, as well as educating people on adopting a vegan or plant-based diet. Metropolitan Energy Center is Kansas City's oldest environmental nonprofit. We're also the only environmental nonprofit that is addressing the two leading effects of climate change, which are transportation and energy generation. Uh, 350.org is focused on building a mass movement worldwide that's powerful enough to overcome the forces that have so far prevented us from taking the kind of um, big, ambitious, and quick action that we should be taking on the climate emergency. We understand that we need to bring in the broadest base possible of people to drive the actions that we need, and so that means addressing all of these issues together. In the past, climate activism had often been relegated as a single issue, in, like in the environmental movement. When we hold strikes like we did on September 20th, it is very important to us that people understand how every issue is a climate issue, right? It should be the lens through which we view all of these other issues. Climate change is affected by pretty much all human activity. So it's an incredibly broad topic and we need experts in a lot of different areas to solve the problems. Where Bridging the Gap is kind of a broad and in some cases generalist organization, we do have some deep pockets of expertise, but we rely on our other partners who have their own deep pockets of expertise to address some of these very complex issues. We do want to prioritize the voices that have been left out. So also, you know, we care about marginalized communities, communities that have historically um, faced injustices. I think it's important to work with other community organizations um, so that we're really like taking a holistic approach to environmental issues. Again, not just environmental movements. We should work more with housing rights movements, with racial justice movements, income justice movements, because they are all so connected. I think it's so important to not only bring together these industry experts from different environmental corners, but also to continue to expand these dialogues to more social justice groups. We're really able to learn how we all influence each other's cause. I think that it's great that people come to the table with different ideals because that's ultimately how we solve problems. And being united under a similar goal with different ways to get there is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, hopefully we can come together to find the best solution. doing away with single-use to-go products. A shop up in Des Moines started using glass, so it kind of sparked the idea, it was like, oh, like, this is actually possible. You can bring 
it back anytime, refill it, get a new one, or get your deposit back. We wanted to make sure it was a size that people could handle really easily and like put in their cup holders in their car and things like that. Like, we know it's not a perfect solution, but our goal isn't to like just create another product that you're gonna throw away. If they have questions why, we'll explain about like the, the impact that climate change has had on coffee production itself. Our goal is to like go through as few as possible to encourage reuse as opposed to recycling, just because glass production and recycling still takes a lot of energy. So we want to get as much as we can out of every single piece. We'd rather it become something that people take ownership of. This is called Papa Tango Sierra Delta requesting medevac over. PTSD. P. T. S. D. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Praying for truth in a state of delusion. Presidents taking shots with drones. Putting together story that deceives. Painted twinkles on a starlit dystopia. P, P, PTSD. Preemptive petroleum power. Panic pills parading promises. Pissy and paranoid but practicing patience. Pacing, pacing, pacing like a displaced palindrome. Premature patriots creating a post-mortem psychosis. The past persists in this pathetic, puny shell of a person. Plain tag with a landmine. T, T, PTSD. Tragic, toxic treason, Taliban torture targets. The television tells a tall tale of trading murder for freedom. Telling the truth takes time and threatens to take your life. Time, time, travels this way and that on a one-way track to tear free liberty. Time, time, takes all the tears and turns them into oceans. Tell me something real. Us. Us. PTSD. Sick symbolic secrets. Star stripes, slippery snakes, stripping your sanity until suicide saves. Selling a systemic schizophrenia where our sisters are only used for sex. Send me back to the sand because seeing all this was not in the plan. Slowly slipping into that space where I'll never survive so many orphans D D PTSD dangerous destitute depression disposable dogmatic destruction dreams of death that lead to dead dreams democratic dysfunction dealing dirty deeds debilitating damage draining a desolate future a daily disappointment but don't ask don't tell, don't get too close. PTSD, P, T, S, D. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Packing tiny shreds dignity. Placing them somewhere distant. Pleading and trapped in sad dysphoria. Pulling the trigger to stop my dying. Pop, pop, pop. Tap, tap, tap. Shots, shots, shots. Drop, drop. Drop.
I am Terrence O'Malley and I'm generally recognized as a Kansas City historian. I have films about Kansas City history. And more than 100 speakeasies and nightclubs operated during the Pendergast era. So the question is, please explore the myths and urban legends related to the Pendergast Mafia of Kansas City. First of all, there was no Pendergast Mafia. There was an Italian Mafia in Kansas City, which was very notorious and with whom Pendergast had a very close relationship. And secondly, boss Tom Pendergast was not a gangster. He did not order hits on anybody. There are no bodies buried in Brush Creek. He was a political influencer who eventually became more and more corrupt as he continued to uh, essentially give effect to his political ambitions. Well, without Tom Pendergast, not only would we not have the Jackson County Courthouse, the Kansas City City Hall, the uh, police department building, uh, and many, many other structures, uh, but also we would not have the great jazz legacy that Kansas City enjoys because it was due to the Pendergast machine's control over the police department, which turned a blind eye toward the operations of illegal speakeasies, bars, and clubs in Kansas City that were allowed to thrive and stay open all hours. And it attracted many musicians to Kansas City uh, who, of course, developed their own flavor of jazz. And without Tom Pendergast's approbation, none of that would have occurred. Stay.